Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Mike Connell of McKee Connell Equine Services. Thank you for joining us. Um, just waiting for a few more people to show up. Um, but what I would like to do is introduce you to Dr. Rafael Gomez from our Calvin Clinic. He works out of our Repro Rehab Center. Um, and Dr. Gomez has a really, really strong interest in Repro since he's joined the practice in early 2021. He has just really, really jumped into the whole uh, repro world of things and he has become such a great resource between all of our practices. So what we thought we would do over the next couple of months is have a series of webinars where Dr. Gomez can talk about um, the various aspects of breeding your mare. Um, the session is being recorded, so if you have to uh, bow out early or what have you, we will be posting the recordings. Um, what I, before I introduce and have Dr. Gomez join us, um, if you have any questions on the Zoom box at the very bottom, it says Q&A. Um, just type your questions in there. I'm going to be sort of hanging out. Um, throughout the session. And when we get to the end, uh, I'll, I'll start uh, asking Dr. Gomez any questions that people may have. Rafa, why don't you put on your um, uh, video so everybody can see you and um, um, let me know if everybody can, there he is. Uh, Hello everyone. <laughs> and so um, maybe I'll pass you over Rafa. Maybe you can just introduce yourself where you're from and where your interest in reproduction came from. Uh, and then we can start the presentation. Yeah, for sure. Well, as you guys know, my name is Dr. Rafael Gomez. I'm from Mexico City. Uh, I studied there in the UNAM. It's the University of Mexico City. Uh, the faculty there is accredited by the AVMA. So it's a very good, cool school and a very good school to go to to learn about uh, veterinary medicine. Uh, my interest in reproduction comes actually from before entering vet school. Um, my dad is also a vet. He does a little bit of reproduction too. So I remember this one day before I went to vet school, um, he let me pop a mare. She was, I don't know, close to full term. So I could feel the foal uh, with the pulp. And at that moment, I knew that that was something that I wanted to do. So I went with great interest to, to, my, to all my repro classes. And then when I finished the career, I did kind of like an, it's kind of like an internship, very specialized and focused on uh, equal reproduction. And when I got, uh, when I graduated, I started working mainly with, uh, with mares. I did some thoroughbred farms, uh, Andalusians, and mainly quarter horses. Um, yeah, that's basically it. I, I had the opportunity to work in Texas, uh, at a, at a private, uh, ranch breeding, doing the breeding season, um, for some, uh, racing quarter horses. And I don't like my main interest right now is everything that has to do with uh, the problem air and embryo transfers. So that's basically what I what I've been doing. And I'm pretty excited for these webinars. I'm pretty excited to get to know you guys and for you to get to know me and talk a little bit about about reproduction. It's gonna be I think it's going to be fun. It's some topics that I think like a lot of people know a little bit about them. And if you don't know about them, this is a great place to start about learning uh, of the mare's um, reproduction. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's going to be a fun couple of webinars. Rafa, as you start, I just got a comment. Somebody said that the sound is a bit scratchy. Just uh, maybe we can try without the AirPods. Just go directly to your um, your laptop to see if that makes a difference with the sound. Yeah, of course. Can you hear me better now? 
Uh, how does that sound, everybody? If you uh, if he sounds better or worse, you just let us know on the Q and A box there. Maybe you just start uh, speaking. Uh, maybe introduce your uh, the session now. Yeah. So basically, today what we're going to talk about is the basics of the estrocycle cycle of the mare. So it's kind of like a complicated topic because we're going to go into some hormones, endocrinology, and a little bit of physiology of the mare. But this is meant uh, for you guys to understand a little bit what we're thinking as vets when we're checking the mares and for you to have uh, an idea of what's going on with your mare when you're trying to breathe her, when she's cycling or when she's not, a little bit of how how her brain is working and what's going on in her um, reproductive system. Can you hear me better now or is it still? Yeah, we're healing. Everybody has commented that it sounds much better. So sounds much better. Carry okay, on. perfect. Yeah. So yeah. if you guys are ready, first of all, I just want to thank you. Thank you all of, uh, all of you that took a little bit of your time to be here uh, with us. I hope you learned something about this talk and that you like it. So here we go. This is actually a fun picture because this is the first mare that I got to see um, a foaling. So I'm very attached to these uh, to these mares. She's a thoroughbred, and it was a weird foaling because it was uh, in the middle of the day. So here we go. Some general information uh, about uh, the mares' reproductive uh, activity. They are categorized as seasonal in the long days. I know most of most of you know that there's a season where mares cycle. Uh, they're categorized as polyesters. What this means is that they have several um, esters or cycles during that period of time. So when the breeding season comes, they're gonna start cycling one, one uh, cycle after the other ones, one cycle after the other one. Uh, they are monoovulatory, but are they? Most of them are. This means that they only ovulate one follicle, one egg or oocyte, as we call them, uh, that is going to be fertilized by the spermatozoid. So most of them are monoovulatory, but there's like 7 to 25% that can have double ovulations. This means that these mares are in risk of having a twin pregnancy. Uh, they reach puberty uh, at 12 to 18 months. It depends a little bit on the breed, but this doesn't mean that um, they reach the sexual maturity by then. Uh, by puberty, we mean that uh, they are they are starting they're starting to cycle and they're gonna be fertile. They're gonna be have having fertile cycles. But when we talk about uh, sexual matu maturity, uh, we're gonna talk about when the mares body is ready to carry a pregnancy. And I usually recommend three to four years old uh, to start breeding a mare. The estrocycle length is around 21 days, plus minus 1.4 days. Uh, it, this varies uh, with, in between mares, right? Um, and the estrus, that is basically the heat, is uh, it's in between five to seven days. So we're gonna do a little bit of a, an anatomy review. We know um, like from the outer part of the mare to the most inner part, we start with the bulba. We have um, a couple of lips. We have the clitoris on the ventral um, commissure of those uh, lips. Then we're gonna have the vestibule that is here before the vagina. And it's very important. It's a very important structure. So we have three main barriers that will protect our mares from any pathogen. So the first one are the bulbar leaves. They're gonna the sealing, how they seal, how they close, is gonna protect the mare from having pathogens crawling inside it. The second one is the vestibule. It's right before the vagina, and it's basically a fold, and it has an angle of forty-five degrees upwards. So that's the second barrier. The third barrier is passing the vagina is the cervix because the cervix is going to relax when it's in estrus or it's going to contract when it's in diestrus. And this won't allow um, anything for to go through uh, the cervix and to reach the uterus. 
So we have the vagina, we have the cervix, then we have the uterus. We have a bicornuate uterus that this just means that it has two horns, one left and one right horn. Uh, after the horns, we have the oviducts. It's a very, very tiny structure that we cannot evaluate with the ultrasound, but it's very important because the process of fertilization is going to be here, right in the oviduct. That's where the magic is going to happen. And then we have the ovaries. Fun fact about Mary's ovaries. As we know, mares really don't like to read the textbook. So they like to make everything complicated. So different from other species, uh, the ovaries are divided in two sections. You have a cortex that is the outside and you have a, a, a medulla that that's the inside of the, of the ovary, that tissue that is inside. Well, the mares, they are flipped over. So in the middle of the ovary, we're going to have the cortex, that that's where the follicles grow. And in the outer layer, we're going to have the medulla that is going to produce hormones and um, all these types of substances. So that's just a, a fun fact about mares and how they like to make our lives more interesting. Uh, okay, so seasonality. This is an important topic. This is just going to be an overview because uh, we all know that mares have the seasonality, right? That they only cycle in a um, certain period of the year. But why? Well, there are several factors. The first one is the photo period. Uh, I think that's the most important. And that's basically the light, light hours. Other factors that influence our nutrition, um, mares that are underweight or in, even overweight are not gonna cycle the same or cycle at all. Um, and that's related with the body condition and the temperature is actually being shown that in colder weathers, um, the mares take longer to start cycling at the beginning of the year. So all of these are correlated, but I think one of the most important is the photo period. And it's one of, um, them that we can play with. So what is the photo period? So the mare and the stallion, they... They work with daylight. So we're gonna need 14 to 16 hours of daylight uh, per day for the mare to start cycling. So this means spring, summer, maybe early fall, that uh, we're gonna have the daylight. How does this work? We have the light, the mare is gonna have, uh, the mare has cells, in the eye, in the retina, that are gonna be perceptive and they're gonna know when the light, uh, when the uh, when the light hours are starting to be higher. So they go to the retina, then they go to the brain, and inside the brain they go to the pineal gland. This pineal gland takes that signal and says to the body, "Okay, it's time for me to stop secretating melatonin." It's not like it stops, but it just lowers that production. It's less. So with less melatonin, this triggers a signal to the hypothalamus and it starts secretating more uh, GnRH that this is gonadotropic releasing hormone. This is a hormone that it will be released in pulses. So these pulses are gonna start to, to grow or to be more constant when the melatonin is down. So they start pulsing, 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 and this is going to go to the pituitary gland. In the pituitary gland, we're going to have the gonadotrope, gonadotrope cell that will produce uh, FSH and LH, gonadotropines. And FSH is follicle stimulant hormone, so it will help produce follicles and the development of them, and the lutein luteinizing hormone. Uh, this is very important hormone because it's going to help um, to um, in the process of the ovulation. So we go from the pineal gland to the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. And then the pituitary gland, this FSH and LH, they go to the ovaries and trigger the signal for follicular development. So follicles are going, going to start growing. And when the follicles grow, they will start producing um, estrogens and this will, bring a, this will bring the heat. So this is a process that takes more or less two months um, when the daylight starts going um, up. 
a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. So this is more or less a very broad how it um, how the photo period works. So then we have the reproductive activity of the mare. So we know we have a breeding season that it's from May to September, and it reaches its peaks uh, on the summer solstice. Then we go to a fall transition. What is what does this mean on the fall transition? Those uh, those light hours, uh, daylight hours, start lowering. And so the mare's um, brain receive that signal and they start producing like the opposite of what I explained. They start producing melatonin. So the GnRH in the hypothalamus drops and everything starts to shut down, getting ready for the anestra season. That's when we're gonna start seeing weird heats on our mares. Sometimes the heat will take longer. Sometimes it will be very short. Uh, we can see anovulatory follicles. So it's it's a weird period where the ovaries are starting to shut to shut down. This usually happens from October to November. Um, all these dates, uh, it's 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 the general idea. Um, then we have the anestro season, and this is a quiet time for the mares, December, February, where they don't cycle at all. They don't have any hormonal activity. Well, they have a hormonal activity. They have very basal GnRH um, levels, but it's not going to trigger any follicular development. So you won't see your mare in heat. But then after December 21st, that is the winter solstice, the daylight starts to grow and to go um, and they start to get longer, that they start to get longer and longer and longer. And we have the spring transi transition. That it's when our mares are going to start cycling and reactivating those uh, ovaries and that activity. So same as it happened in the fall transition, those ovaries will start doing weird stuff because they're going to start responding to those, those GnRH pulses and FSH pulses. Uh, but it's not going to be enough until they have the first ovulation of the of the cycle of the breeding season. And after the first ovulation, they just start going normally, 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 every 21 days, every 21 days, more or less. So it's important that we have this on mind because uh, we're going to see our mares through the years doing all these. And this explains a lot of behaviors that we see in them um, throughout the year. Okay, so now to the estro cycle, uh, what we're here to talk about. So the estro cycle, the definition is a period between two ovulations with estrous behavior. Estrous, we're gonna define it as heat. As we commonly no name it, that's the heat behavior. So the mare is gonna be receptive. She will um, accept the stallion, pee, winking, uh, all these. The length is 21 days plus minus 1.4 days. Um, this obviously changes between mares because we know they don't, some mares, they don't read the textbook. So <laughs> we're going to have um, some variance between it. And it's divided in two phases. So we have a follicular phase or estrus heat. And then we have a luteal phase or diestrus. Follicular phase, it's called like that because we're going to have follicle. The follicle is going to be the dominant thing in the ovaries. And luteal fell phase, um, the corpus luteum, the structure that forms after a mare has ovulated, that forms in the ovary, um, it's going to be the dominating, uh, dominating structure in the ovary. That's why they are called like, um, like that. So I know... This seems like too much and it's a little scary, uh, but this is actually the best graphic. And this is what, what's in our mind all the time when we're looking at the mares. And my goal for this talk is for you at the end of the, the, the presentation to know a little bit uh, about these, these, these chart, to understand it a little bit and know why your mares are behaving a certain way during the, the estro cycle and the breeding season. So we can see here that we have the two main uh, phases, the estrus and the diestrus. We know the estrus uh, is from five to seven days 
uh, long and the diesterous from 14 to 16 days, more or less. We have a bunch of hormones. Uh, we have follicular, follicular development. These are tiny follicles. Um, and here we have the ovulation. So one thing that we have to understand, we take as day zero uh, in this chart and in the cycle as the day of ovulation. So we're going to go from that, um, from there. So, okay, we're going to start with the estrus or follicular phase. As I said before, the length of this phase is five to seven days. Ovulation is going to happen 24 to 48 hours before the estrus ends. So this is why sometimes when we inseminate a mare or we're following a mare, um, you see that the mare ovulated, but one day after or two days after, she's still in heat. That's completely normal. That's a way of the, that the mare is in the wild, um, ensure to be bred. Um, and what behavioral changes we're gonna see in our mare? First, they're gonna have an interest in the stallions. And this is correlated with the acceptance of copulation. They're gonna turn their hindquarters to the stallion. Uh, they're gonna lower the pelvis. They're gonna straddle their hinds, open them a little bit. There's gonna be deviation of the tail, frequent urination. This is just to, uh, to call for the stallion to have his attention. And we're going to have the winking that it's uh, an aversion of the clitoris. We can also see mares wink after they pee, but they just do it like a couple of times. Uh, while when they're in heat, they are constantly doing, especially when st the stallion is around. And other things that you can see, um, they're not going to be that interested in the food. So the, the, the feed consumption can <laughs> drop a little bit because all they're going to think about is the crush that they have at that moment with the stallion. So I have a little video here uh, of mare winking. That's the aversion of the clitoris. That's how it looks. That's something that we're looking for. Um, and here we have a video of a mare showing signs of estrus. And it's important that we differentiate uh, the signs of estrus and the signs of the estrus. So the stallion is inside. We're doing, uh, we're teasing the mare. Uh, I think teasing mares, it's one of the most valuable things that we can do in any uh, breeding program. But here we can see like all of the signs that we described before, right? So she's moving the tail. She's putting it into a side. She's peeing. She, is, uh, she has opened the hindquarters. Uh, we can see some of the some of that winking. She's receptive to the stallion. She wants to be with him. She, she's just like, hey, where are you, right? Um, that's the heat. So which hormones are present when the mare is in heat? Well, we have a little bit of that FSH that is going to grow our follicle. And that follicle is the one that is going to produce estrogens and that it that those estrogens are the ones giving us that behavior. We're also going to have the luteinizing hormone, LH. Uh, we talked about it before. This is going to promote ovulation in the mare. So first, we need to have the FSH for those follicles to grow and reach a dominance. We are going to have one uh, dominant follicle. And then we're going to have that LH that is going to trigger the signal for that follicle to pop, ovulate, uh, release that oocyte into the oviduct, uh, and hopefully reach a, a spermatozoid and have a fertilization problem. Uh, not problem. <laughs> uh, the fertilization process. <laughs> then we have in inhibin. Um, this is a this is also a hormone that is produced by the follicle uh, by the follicle by the dominant follicle, and it's uh, a fun hormone because it just stops other follicles from growing. So that's one uh, of the reasons of why the mare it's monovulatory. We have these follicles that are secreting inhibin, and those um, are repressing the growth on other follicles. So here we go again. 
what's going on in estrus we have uh we have our two our two graphics so the fsh the peak is not when she's uh she next in estrus is when it's starting but we can see here where the fsh uh it's growing um it's getting higher we, we're going to have the process of deviation uh, that that's when a follicle starts reaching domin dominance. So we see here that there's this dominant follicle. Here's the dominant follicle. And we're going to have, we're going to, he's going to reach the peak of dominance uh, in a pre ovulatory phase when it reaches 35 millimeters uh, in diameter. And we're going to have the inhibit just growing here. Um, yep. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The inhibin is the is the yellow one. I'm I'm sorry about that. We're gonna have the inhibin here uh, with the follicle that is growing, because uh, this is going to stop the other follicles from growing. Then we're gonna have uh, estradiol or estrogens that this follicle is going to produce. We're gonna have a peak of them because this is going to give us uh, all the estrus behavior and all the changes that we need in the anatomy of the mare that are gonna be. That, that they're going to be good for fertilizing for the spermatozoids and for the sperm of the uh, of the stallions to reach the oocyte. So we have these. Then we have the LH. We have it down here. We see that we don't have a peak, but we have a constant growth of the LH, and we have the ovulation. LH is the responsible for the ovulation in the mare. So this is basically what is going on in the estrus. So we have the FSH growing the follicle. We have inhibin uh, that uh, in, inhibits, as its name says it, um, the growth of other follicles. We have estrogens or estradiol giving us heat behavior and all the changes that we're going to see uh, in the anatomy of the mare. And we have LH that is going to give us uh, the ovulation. So these anatomic changes are the ones that we are going to evaluate when we're seeing a mare, when we're doing the reproductive um, assessment on her. So first of all, what we're going to see in the in the ultrasound is going to be a dominant follicle. It's going to be over 35 uh, millimeters, and it's going to be the responsible of producing that, that uh, estrogens. What are those estrogens going to do? So in the uterus, they're going to create edema. That, that's basically... Um, more blood flow to that area. Why? Because the uterus is preparing itself uh, for a foreign body, that is the sperm. So the sperm is a foreign body. It's not natural for a, mare, for a uterus to have anything inside. So it's preparing for it. So mares naturally are going to react to that, um, to the sperm, to the semen of the stallion. So for that, they need blood there. They need blood supply that is gonna bring uh, defense cells too. So we're going to see the edema, and we're going to talk a little bit um, about the edema in the next uh, slide. Uh, and then the cervix. This is, our, this is a very cool picture. Um, this is a cervix from a mare in estrus. This is a cervix from a mare in diestrus. So you can see how it's relaxed. It's going to be open. Why? Because the semen, the semen has to go inside, right, in order to reach the oocyte. So a lot of times we're going to do like a spec uh, e uh, examination or vaginoscopy to evaluate the cervix to make sure that it doesn't have any tears or, um, or um, uh, any, any attachments or any pathology in the, in the cervix. So that's basically what's going on in the reproductive uh, tract of the mare. And that's what we as veterinarians are evaluating. I'm pretty sure that all of you that have um, have done a breeding process on a mare, at some point your vet's going to say, hey, she has a follicle this big, she has a lot of edema, or she doesn't have any edema, or she has fluid in the uterus. At this point, we know that she's in heat because she has a big, big follicle. She's, uh, she has edema that tells us that there's estrogens there. So that's all of the things that we're looking for when we're checking the mare. So here is just a little chart that I, I took out of uh, Dr. McEwen, Dr. Descanio's book, uh, where he explains the edema in the mare's uterus. That's how we graded um, 
when we're looking at it in the ultrasound. So no edema or grade zero, it would be a uterus in diesters when there, where there is no uh, estrogens. We have edema grade one, that's when a mare is coming into heat, slowly coming, or when she is very, very close to ovulation and for that estrus to end, so at the corners. We have edema grade uh, two, that would be in the middle of, um, of the estrus. And edema grade three, that it's a heavy, heavy uh, edema. That it could be, it could be normal in a mare, but this grade of edema, like see, watching these folds uh, with so much edema, would consider, would be considered pathological. So now we're moving to the next phase. So our mare was in heat. We know she had a dominant follicle. We know she had FSH, LH, inhibiting. Uh, estrogens and that she ovulated. Okay, once she ovulated, it um, and it has passed 24 to 48 hours. We're gonna go into the diestrous or luteal phase. So what is it? Um, the diestrous or luteal phase. Uh, the length is from 14, 14 to 16 days. Uh, the main structure that we're gonna see is gonna be the corpus luteum. Uh, that is going to produce progesterone, P4, and behavioral changes. So the exact opposite. They won't be uh, interested in the stallion. They will squeal, strike, kick, bite, and they will have these very aggressive uh, facial expressions. So we have a video here where we can see we're teasing with a, with a teaser stallion, and we can see the mare right away backs up, you can see she has an aggressive um, expression. And then when, when he goes up, she's like, okay, stop it. <laughs> I don't want that. So we can tell that the mare is not in heat. And we know that she's in this phase, diestrous or luteal phase. Which hormones we're going to see here? Progesterone, prostaglandins, and FSH2. Because the FSH has a long curve and it actually starts... Um, uh, it starts going up in the diestrus, and we're going to go about it here again. Here we go to, <laughs> to our chart again. So we talk a little bit about progesterone. So the progesterone, as soon as the mare ovulates and that corpus luteum then becomes a, a that, um, that uh, follicle ovulates, it becomes a corpus uh, hemorrhagic. So it fills out a blood and then um, that blood clot that is formed inside that follicle, luteinizing cells are going to start growing, and these cells are the ones responsible for producing progesterone. So as soon as she ovulates, the progesterone levels are start uh, will start going um, up. Then we're going to have it. It's going to reach its peak around day four or five, and then we're going to reach like a plateau, and then. We talk about uh, prostaglandins, PGF2 alpha. So this prostaglandin is produced by the uterus. And when the uterus um, gets the signal that there's not an embryo there, uh, it's like, I'm not pregnant, I'm empty. Okay, I need to cycle again. So they're gonna produce this progesterone, this uh, prostaglandin, sorry. That these prostaglandins, what they're gonna do is they're gonna go to this corpus luteum and they're going to lyse it, that it basically means they're going to kill it. So it will stop the production of progesterone right away. It will lower the levels and we'll start uh, right here again. So everything starts uh, going up, the estrogens, uh, inhibin, and the LH, uh, and the FSH. But as I said, the FSH, we can see that it starts uh, going high. Uh, around day seven. Why is that? We have in the ovarian or follicular dynamics, we have two waves, two follicular waves. We have a primary wave that will start here in the diestrus, and we have a secondary wave that is going to start here in the estrus. So the first wave is the one that is going to give us this dominant uh, follicle. So we need this FSH to start rising in order for this follicle to start growing, to start uh, deviating and to reach dominance. That's why we have FSH here in the diestrus, but we can, we also have it here. 
and we have a little peak at the end of the estrus here. So this is the second uh, follicular wave, the secondary follicular wave. This is a very important wave because it usually, normally, these follicles will go to um, atresia. It, uh, atresia. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it in, in English. But this is the process where it goes, um, it starts growing a little bit. We have a little bit, uh, we have deviation. So we have, we start to have uh, a follicle that might want to go uh, to dominance. But when we have the progesterone levels going up and everything else going down, this follicle will just regress and it won't, uh, it won't go to dominance. There's an, uh, there's an exception to the rule. As we know, as I said before, mares, they don't like to go, uh, at like, <laughs> like they don't like to read the textbook. So there are mares that with this little bit of FSH here that they have here, a follicle might reach dominance. And here with the LH, because it doesn't have a peak and it doesn't go, uh, go low right away after ovulation, we have this uh, slow curve down. You could have a diestrous ovulation. And this means that you're going to have a mare that will ovulate here. And that would be a problem because it would cause a persistent CL. That would be something that uh, you would see a mare that she came in heat. And this is this is something that has happened to me before with uh, some mares with some cases and with some clients that they call me and they say, I've, I've read my mare, she ovulated. And if they don't do preg checks, they just wait to see if she comes back into heat 21 days after. And she's like, nope, she's not into heat. Perfect, she's pregnant. And they, they never did a preg check. You go on and you it might be that she just has an accessory corpus luteum um, and a persistent CL, sorry, that is going to make you think that the mare is pregnant, but she's not. She just had a diestrous ovulation. So that's kind of like the importance of knowing this chart and this graphic, and that's the beauty of equine reproduction, that we're always thinking about all these curves and all these moments and what can be happening in the mare. So how does this translate to the, uh, to the, anato to the anatomy of the mare and to what we see in the ultrasound? So in the ovaries, we're going to see the CL, the corpus luteum. So we can see that it's uh, an echoic, um, an echoic um, structure in the ultrasound. This is the CL. This, uh, this echogenicity is given by the luteal cells, the ones that are promoting, um, that are producing the progesterone. Uh, we're going to have the primary, primary follicular wave. So we are going to start seeing some follicular development. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to see the uterus without edema, no fluid or anything, just very, very quiet. And same image uh, that we saw before, but we want to see that cervix close and very tight. In this uh, stage of the estrous cycle, the mare is preparing everything for an embryo, for a foal. So we want that uterus to be quiet. We don't want a lot of blood supply or blood or defense cells because that uterus has to be quiet and has to be cozy for that embryo to to get uh, in there we need the cervix to be closed because we don't want that embryo to just like go outside in the vagina and then be expelled right and we need the progesterone because the progesterone is what's going to get us through the whole um, pregnancy so this is like this is more or less what the estrocycle cycle of the mare is. Uh, in conclusion, uh, mares are seasonal and polyestric. We know what that means. The breeding season is from May to September. Uh, the estrocycle cycle length is 21 days plus minus 1.4 days. The length of the estrus is five to seven days. And we know that the hormone that is predominant there are the estrogens that are giving us all that behavior. The diestrous uh, length is from 14 to 16 um, days, and we know that the progesterone is the, the dominant hormone uh, in that stage. So what can, what can you do if you're thinking about breeding your mare? So all this information, practical tips, 
if you want to breathe your mare early in the season, we need light therapy. Why? Because all of the seasonality and photo period that we went at the beginning of the presentation, we need 14 to 16 days of our um, 14 to 16 hours a day. Um, you only need 100 uh, lux, so it doesn't have to be a very, very strong uh, light. And in order for this treatment to work, um, it has to be done for 60 days. So it's two months. So if you're thinking about reading your mare early in the season, uh, you should start right away. Like I usually recommend November 15 or at the end of uh, November. So mares will start cycling at the beginning of February. They are gonna start to having maybe their first cycles or their first heat behaviors. And hopefully they will have their first ovulation by February 15. Um, Tease your mares and know their behavior. If you have this possibility, if you have, uh, if you're breeding um, a bunch of mares, a great investment is a, a teaser stallion, because he's gonna tell you a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot about your mares. Uh, what stage of the cycle are they? How long it lasts? Um, and also, you will know their behavior. Because there are mares that are very dominant and they won't show any signs of heat, even though they're in heat. And that's very important for you to know, especially if you're doing nat natural um, breeding, like natural cover. And it's also good for the veterinarian to know, because um, you might think, why is my mare not coming into heat? I want to breathe her, but she's not coming to heat, even though I have a teaser stallion, she's just like reluctant and she doesn't like him. Well, have her check and you will know um, that behavior and for next season or next cycle, next cycles, uh, you will know that that mare just doesn't show and that you have to be on top of her. Another recommendation, check your mares early in the season. Why? Because that, that will uh, give us a lot of information and we will know how your mare is behaving and how is she cycling. As I said before, every mare, every mare cycles different. They ovulate in different size uh, of follicles and they behave differently. So if you start checking your mares early and we can keep track of them, it will make everything way easier and you will have better success when you're trying to breathe her. Following their cycles, it's more, I mean, it's related to the to the previous one. And same with the records. I mean, these, these three, they go all together because you want to have records. Don't just trust the vet. I mean, obviously the vets are going to have, they will have the records, but if you have them, I don't know, if you change vets or whatever, you can just say, hey, I know this mare ovulates um, around 35 millimeters or these mares goes to 45 millimeters or you know what last year this mare had an anovulatory follicle um, if you keep records of your mares you're gonna have better success you're gonna have a better relationship with uh with the veterinarian because you're gonna you're gonna know your mares and he's gonna tell you what's going on with your mares you're gonna know what's going on um, inside their their brain and their reproductive system and you're going to have a better success when you're trying to breed them, especially if you're ordering semen and you're bringing semen, I don't know, from the States and you have to call the stallion, uh, uh, the stallion people to get the semen one day before, they, they ship it the next day, and then you'll get it 24 hours after that. There's a lot of planning in, in reproduction. So that's the other tip. Plan ahead. If you're trying to breed your mare early or not, uh, if you're just if you want to wait and see when she starts cycling on her own, that's fine, but just follow these, uh, these tips, tease them, follow them, keep records and plan ahead. Cause I think most of our work doing reproduction is just planning ahead, planning ahead, thinking about the future. What, what, what's this mare is going to do? What, how did she behave last year? Um, how are we going to get her pregnant um, just with one uh, with one breeding at the first breeding? So I think that's that's very important for mare owners to to do. Now you know 
what's going on in their brains, in their ovaries, uh, in the reproductive tract. So when your vet goes, checks your mare, and he tells you, okay, she has a follicle of 35, so you know that, oh, I know that there's estrogens there, that she's, uh, she's in heat, that the uterus is preparing to receive semen, and that we are good to, to breed the mare. So that that would be it for the for the talk um, from today. Don't forget that we have uh, more talks coming uh, in the next months. We're gonna talk about breeding the problem mare. That's the mare that you just cannot get pregnant. That she builds fluid or she has infections. Um, we're gonna do one of uh, insemination of the mare. That is basically differentiating between fresh, cool, and frozen semen, and how we manage the mares uh, in order to inseminate them. Uh, embryo transfers, and we're going to have another with uh, foaling, and what you need to know about foaling, uh, the stages, and some tips and stuff that you can have like a owner, like an owner's kit for, for your mare that is about to foal. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, uh, I, I'm happy to, to answer them. Hey, Rafa, uh, that was excellent. We have three questions. Uh, I'm just going to yep. stop sharing your screen. Um, yep. um, and just so uh, people can see you talking and answering the questions. Um, so if you can maybe just hit uh, stop share. Um, so the first question is, can you still breed your mare in the winter with that special light? With light, okay. So that's that's a very good, good question. Uh, maybe I, I'll share my screen and I'll go back to the, to the slides. That might help me, um, yeah. Sorry, Mike. I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen again. <laughs> sure, of course. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, uh, but this is this is a this is a very good um, question. We're gonna go to one of the first slides that we saw in the reproductive activity. So here it is. The winter. It depends on the mare. There is a small percentage of mares that are going to cycle all year long, but it's a very very tiny percentage of those mares. Um, you're going to see more of that the closer you get to the Ecuador. Uh, the higher you are in the world, the mares show more seasonality. They are more responsive to the daylights. So the winter, in the winter where we are in an estrus. So an estrus is a very, very fun place to be because we can play with it. This is where we're gonna start our light programs. This is where we're gonna start the light treatment. You cannot, you cannot play with the fall transition. You cannot play with spring transition. Once a mare is in transition, we can give hormones, we can give light, we can give whatever, but they're not gonna respond. They just have to get out of that transition. So in an estrus, if you're trying to breathe a mare in the winter and she's already in an estrus, say if she came earlier, early fall, uh, she, she had an early fall transition and she came in an estrus close to November. If you do the light treatment, you have to remember that you need at least two months, two months of that light treatment. So it's gonna be very hard, but you might push it to breathe a mare in February, January, it would be very hard to breed a mare that is not cycling in December and November. And as I said before, there are there there are exceptions where mares just go to an estrus before, or they just start cycling uh, before, or there are mares that, mares that just cycle all year long. So it's a very good question. It will depend on the mare. Uh, yeah. I, I hope that answered the, the, the question. Yeah, some of the next questions are probably uh, related to your next topic. We'll maybe just talk about them briefly. Um, the next one is, I've had less success with maiden mares. They seem to catch the following year. Is there any reason why this may happen? 
with maiden mares? Yes. That depends they a lot. They don't catch the first year, but they do the second year. The second year. It depends on the age of the mares. That's that's important to, to know. The second one is you have to evaluate all the breeding process that went on the first year. Um, if you, yeah, that it depends on the, on the, sorry, going back, it depends on the age of the mare. The age is very important because it's not the same to have a maiden mare that is four years old or five years old than a maiden mare that is in their late teens, right? 15, 16. We know for a fact that after 15 years old, uh, the uterus starts to, um, to it starts to deteriorate. That's the word, to deteriorate. Uh, if the mare is young, you need, there are several factors to consider. You need to consider the stallion. You need to consider the, the breeding process, what semen you were using. You need to consider if that mare had an infection or had, an, uh, had a reaction. Um, and yeah, I, I think I would, that would focus more in those, uh, in those things with the, with the maiden mares. Also, an, another thing that it would be important to do is cultural and cytology. And we're going to talk about that in the next talk in, um, the breeding the problem mare, but not just because a mare is a maiden, that doesn't mean that she couldn't have, uh, an infection in the uterus. Next question, and I'm sure you'll probably be talking about this the next time, but as part of the reproductive process, do veterinarians ever administer certain hormones to amplify certain parts of the marriage cycle? Yes, yes, we do. And that's, uh, that's one of the things that we, that we like to do is we just like to play with these. So we have several hormones that we use in equine reproductions that they're going to be similar to the hormones that you see here. So this is all the base. So I'm pretty sure everyone has heard the term hotshot. So basically the hotshot, it's given, it's, give to, it's given to a merit to short cycle them. This means to shorten the, the diastrous part of the cycle. Why? Because here's what matters to us, right? We want to breathe the air. And to breathe the mare, she needs to be in heat. She needs to be in estrus. So hot shot is basically prostaglandins. What we do is instead of waiting for the body to produce prostaglandins on day 14, 16, we can give it uh, after day six. I mean, for the prostaglandins to work, we need uh, the corpus luteum to, be, to have receptors for those prostaglandins. And those came uh, on day five. So after day five, we can administer prostaglandins and we're just gonna shorten this diastrous uh, area. So that's one of the hormones that we use a lot because uh, it just gives us that shorten, shortening on time. And in repro, timing is everything. The other ones that we use, they are going to be similar to the LH. So we're gonna have Corilon or Deslorelin, uh, if you have heard of those those are inductive uh, hormonal agents. So that's very fun because instead of um, waiting for a mare to ovulate on her own, we can just administer uh, a hormone that is kind of like the LH that helps us ovulate. And after administration, that mare is going to ovulate in between 36 to 40 hours post-administration. For these, we need to know that the mare needs to have a pre-ovulatory follicle, so higher than 35 millimeters, and that that follicle is producing a lot of estrogens, meaning that we're gonna see a lot of edema in that uterus. So yeah, those are basically the hormones that we use. We also use the regumate, uh, that that's basically progesterone. We're gonna use that one when we don't like the tone that we feel when we pop a mare uh, that has been bred. Uh, or if we take a progesterone sample and it's not over two nanograms per deciliter, um, we're going to supplement that. When we think that the pregnancy is in risk, we're going to uh, supplement progesterone because progesterone is basically the pregnancy hormone. So those are, those are the main hormones that we use. And that's how we can play with all these things that we explained today. 
Two more questions, uh, Rafa. First one from Jackie is, can you talk a little bit about atypical estrus? For example, a mare that goes into heat all winter, what could be some of the causes of that? Well, there are, there are, there are several causes that can lead you to that. One could be uh, that she's stuck in transitional phase and that she's just getting um, small growths uh, of follicles that they don't reach ovulation and that they stay big and they keep producing a little bit of estrogens and she keeps uh, acting like she's in heat. Another thing that we need to think about are other type of pathologies like uh, ovarian tumors um, that will alter also the, the hormonal production of those ovaries. And that will lead to that kind of behavior, a mare that is always in estrus or even a mare that is behaving as a stallion, that, uh, that's a common one. So also there are mares at very tiny percentage, but that they can cycle all year. And it wouldn't be weird to see them just like very, very, like very, like having very good cycles, like every 21 years, like coming to heat, five days, going down, that, 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 like that. Last question. Is it better, in your opinion, to wait until a mare is four years old for breeding, so she would foal as a five-year-old? Is three-year-olds for breeding a bit too young yet? That's a very good question. Um, I think it's it's best for the mares if you breed as a four-year-old and she's gonna fall uh, as a five-year-old. And here's why. The growth uh, plates uh, on the osseous um, skeleton of the horse, they all complete the ossification uh, at five years old. So the mare is gonna be fully developed. If you're gonna go, if you're gonna start earlier, you can do that. And we bred mares in three years, three years old that they're going to fall at, a, at four years old. They are sexually mature. But my recommendation would be if you breed her at four years old and she's going to fall out at uh, five years old. All right. I think that is it. Oh, one last question. Somebody got in at the last one at the wire. Uh, is there anything special that should be done with a six-year-old mated performance mare at this time to get ready for breeding this coming spring other than lights? I think you need to focus on, uh, if you want to breed her early, the lights, focus on the nutrition of that mare. You don't want a mare that is fat and you don't want a mare that is thin. So in a scale from one to nine, one being emaciated or really thin, nine being obese, you want a mare to sit right in the middle at number five in the body's core condition. Um, make sure that she is uh, healthy. You can, you can either have her check right now or if not, when the spring comes. If you put her on lights, well, after the two months, have her checked by a vet and do a reproductive assessment. Uh, it would be good to start thinking about culture and cytology before you breed the mare and start thinking about your options. What do you want to do with a performance mare? Do you want her to carry the foal at six years old um, and stop working? Give her that year and the year to foal and then bring her back uh, into full work. Do you want to do embryo transfers and start looking for recipient mares so you can keep working with the, with working with the mares, you can keep competing, and she's just going to have two weeks off for the for the reproductive um, management that is basically inseminating and then the flush, and then she can continue working. So I would be thinking about that. Uh, start checking the bloodlines. Um, the genetic is, it's, it's important to start looking for a good match. Um, and yeah, just keep her, keep her healthy and happy. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And we look forward to welcome everybody back in January. Happy holidays, everybody.
Yeah, th thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, see you in January. Happy holidays. I hope you like this talk and that you learn a little bit about, at least about the hormones. <laughs> Good night, everybody. See ya. <laughs>